I think damage can be done by by proceeding as if we had settled, for example, the question of Hume's dictum, or we had settled the question of like how best to understand metaphysical dependence and so on. So I think we, you just always have to have some little voice in your ear saying, okay, go for it, but just keep in mind <laughs> that there are these other approaches. They're, they haven't been ruled out. Properly testing your own hypothesis requires properly engaging with, you know, your best viable con contenders and so on and so forth. Welcome everyone to today's interview, where we are very pleased to have Professor Jessica Wilson. She is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Toronto Scarborough. Uh, her area of research focuses on a range of topics in metaphysics from grounding, emergence, causation, and more, as well as philosophy of mind, epistemology, and metaphilosophy. Um, her book, Metaphysical Emergence, is out this year and she has numerous published articles and, and contributions in the field. Feel free to add anything, but with that, uh, welcome and thanks so much for being here, Professor Wilson. Troy, thanks for having me on. Awesome. So I wanted to start with some, some questions about um, grounding and maybe sort of as a first introduction to that, um, I wonder if you could give a good way to think about the difference between what you might call capital G grounding, the more robust metaphysical grounding, um, of which you are um, skeptical that there's a, a use for, and you know, lowercase g grounding, um, which you think is uh, we can talk about in, the, in a sensible way. Uh, sure. Um, well, the first thing I would say is that the contrast between you know what I've called big G grounding. Um, and the uh, other specific small g grounding relations is not really one of robustness per se. So, you know, in my view, uh, there are plenty of metaphysical dependence relations out there, or, you know, uh, more specifically, metaphysical relations that, you know, against backdrop drop suppositions about what is fundamental serve as uh, metaphysical dependence relations in a, you know in as robust a fashion as you might like but the the contrast is rather uh, as I see it well really along two dimensions one is that big G grounding uh, is supposed to be primitive um, you know as opposed to these sort of off-the-shelf resources, you know, that uh, are associated with, for example, functional realization, the mereological part-whole relation, um, you know, conjunction, uh, disjunction, et cetera. Um, it's uh, also, the second important difference, I think, is that it's supposed to be operative in any and all contexts in which metaphysical dependence um, is that issue. And in that sense, it's, it's kind of a generic. So uh, at least the initial proponents of big G grounding were treating it as a kind of primitive, generic metaphysical dependence relation. And it was supposed to be robust in the sense that it was not, you know, uh, uh, it was, it was, supposed to be properly metaphysical and substantive by way of contrast, for example, with um, kind of deflationary treatments of metaphysical dependence in terms of supervenience or modal correlations or maybe conceptual entailment. So, you know, big G grounding was supposed to be a properly metaphysical metaphysical dependence relation. And, you know, you know, my own view is, is that, uh, properly metaphysical dependence relations are in fact really important. So I, you know, I agree with the big G grounders about that, but I just think that um, the case has not been made for there being a primitive generic notion of metaphysical dependence, given the availability of all these, you know, robust slash substantive 
uh, specific metaphysical relations. Right. So, I mean, I guess if we're comparing these approaches, though, you both have um, a sort of something which counts as primitive. For them, it's the, the grounding relation. For you, it's what is fundamental. I have that right. And um, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe well, we talk about that. Yeah, very good. Yeah, that's exactly right. So we each have our primitive. And I'd like my primitive better than theirs. Uh, <laughs> so I, I guess yeah. in brief, though, like wh why? What are some reasons to prefer um, having the what's fundamental as primitive rather than than the relation? Well, this is you know a proper answer to that excellent question is really going to take up my time for the next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and make the case in a book tentatively titled Fundamentality and Metaphysical Dependence. Um, you know, in, uh, in trying to make my case, I have to uh, kind of make the case not just against um, Big G grounding, but, you know, Bennett, Karen Bennett's, uh, you know, building relations, which are sort of a variation on a pluralist approach, but one which, with, which eschews a, a primitivist notion of fundamentality. So basically, there are a bunch of package deals out there. And I have my preferred package deal. And then I, I need to make my case. I have to look. I, I think it's important to look at not just sort of an account of fundamentality uh, or an account of metaphysical dependence in isolation, but rather at these package deals, um, which uh, target what I call metaphysical structure. This is, you know, something also Schaffer talks about metaphysical structure. This is not Sidarian structure per se, if you know what I'm try talking about. Mm -hmm. but builds in a notion of naturalness as associated with bits of language or you know, uh, worldly correlates thereof, but rather just the idea that, um, you know, uh, there are uh, in many different contexts or, um, you know, there are case studies of uh, views in, in the sciences and religion and philosophy where some goings on are uh, taken to be fundamental or relatively fundamental and then other goings on which are not part or seemingly not part of the fundamental base are taken to be metaphysically dependent on the goings on in the fundamental or the comparatively fundamental uh, base and so these case studies of metaphysical structure i think are you know they're pretty ubiquitous um in you know across these different fields and so on and then there's different approaches to you know understanding uh, the philosophical or metaphysical underpinnings of those of those case studies. So, um, in order, for example, if you want to, in a way that your question just brought out, you can't just say, "Oh, well, I've got a primitive notion of fundamentality, but this other person understands what it is, uh, what makes it the case for some, that some goings on are fundamental." Uh, they analyze that in terms of being ungrounded, for example. You know, so my notion of fundamentality involves a primitive, whereas theirs do doesn't. But that's not enough to sort of um, properly assess the balance of primitive ontological commitment because they have, as part of their uh, package deal, they also have a primitive. So this is why I say that um, properly assessing um, my account vis-a-vis -vis these other accounts requires properly assessing this, you know, a range of package deals. One of them uh, is one that says, look, the, the core or primary notion of metaphysical dependence is primitive, this primitive generic big G grounding. And then I use that primitive generic to analyze, you know, what makes it the case that some goings on are fundamental. Um, Bennett's approach is different. She has specific building relations, but she also wants to analyze the uh, notion of fundamentality 
in terms of those building relations. So that's a different package deal that I have to look at. There's also Kit Fine's package deal, which, you know, arguably involves two different primitives, um, both a primitive notion of fundamentality and also some kind of primitive uh, notion of generic dependence and variations on that theme. So um, that's just by way of setup. <laughs> so I can't give you a full answer to this question, but I will just say that um, I I think with respect to the initial kind of package deal involving big G grounding and uh, an analysis of what makes it the case that some goings on are fundamental in terms of being ungrounded. Uh, one concern I have with that um, that particular package deal is that it doesn't, on the face of it, make room for accounts of metaphysical structure um, on which the fundamenta are self-dependent or self-grounding, if you like, uh, to speak you know neutrally, um, or are interdependent, um, as some um, uh, as is the case on some. Uh, Buddhist views, for example, Huyan Buddhism, or uh, perhaps a kind of variation on the Leibnizian theme of interdependent monads. Uh, there are uh, other cases of fundamenta, for example, in the case of strong emergence uh, associated with the British emergentists, such as C.D. Broad and so on. So I discuss this a lot in my book. Um, you know, those are for the strong emergentists. Strongly emergent phenomena are partly dependent on, you know, some base level goings on, but they themselves are fundamental. So, you know, to understand what it is to be fundamental or what makes it a case that uh, some goings on are fundamental in terms of their being ungrounded kind of rules out of court or doesn't naturally, you could say, doesn't naturally accommodate these seeming cases of metaphysical structure. So one thing I like about a primitivist approach is that it's able to ecumenically accommodate all the, you know, the full range of case studies, which I think are are kind of data when we're trying to uh, explore how best to understand metaphysical structure. And um, that's one consideration. I'll just mention one other one as well, which is that uh, I think the pluralist no approach to metaphysical dependence at, is is one that um, is methodologically, uh, sub, you know, supported. That's what philosophers actually do: uh, is they look not just, you know, for uh, a kind of generic. They want to know. It, it really, we don't really have an answer to a given question of what depends on what until we know more precisely how some goings on depend on some others. Um, and so uh, I think for purposes of metaphysical investigation, you can't do without attention to the specific small g grounding relations, which are, you know, really giving you information about the details of dependence. So given that we we need those small g relations uh, in the first place, you know, um, in, in order to, to conduct our metaphysical investigations, there's this further question of why we would need big G grounding um, in addition to the small G relations. So those are I so those are just a couple of considerations. You know, again, the dialectic goes back and forth, and you may ask a follow-up question to that, uh, you know, pressing me about some other reasons uh, for thinking that uh, we can do without big G grounding. But you know, that's that's those are a couple of considerations anyway. No, very, very good. A lot of good points there. I mean, I definitely agree um, on the on the point that when like comparing two different commitments or more, it's often important to compare also the broader frameworks in which those commitments are made. Um, yeah. Because, you know, that's ultimately what we're committing to an overall, a broader theory. And uh, um, good. you also say, so one reason that uh, some have suggested um, in favor of a more robust theory of grounding or, or, or a more um, a primitive notion of grounding of the, of, of the sort that you're talking about um, is that we need that in order to understand like the direction of priority between yeah. 
um, uh, things. And um, on your view, we can just in some way determine uh, what counts as fundamental and then discover facts about priority based on that. Um, I guess the question, the first question is how do we, I guess, how do we determine what is fundamental? Is it just some sort of metaphysical theorizing or intuition or it's not some mere stipulation, right? I mean, there is a fact of the matter. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's not a mere stipulation, uh, at the level of like the metaphysics of the of the view. Okay, so my package deal, yeah, I have been recently calling it the fundamentality first view. Okay, so um, which you know basically because the the fundamental is you know what what is fundamental is sort of primitively specified, but the specification there uh, is uh, properly worldly it's nothing to do with stipulation okay stipulation comes into play when we're thinking about the methodology of our investigations into metaphysical structure so since we don't have a kind of direct insight into what which goings on are in fact fundamental you know sort of the thing that we have to do and what has been done throughout history you know in philosophy as well as in science and and also in diverse religious traditions is that there's a kind of uh um you know you can call it a stipulation if you like uh it, it's uh you know like a hypothesis is made either as a work it maybe it's a working hypothesis it might be also you know taken on board uh, for the sake of argument, like, and, and sometimes uh, for antagonistic purposes. So if I'm a dualist, I might say, okay, well, suppose that the only fundamental goings on are, are physical. Now, how would we fit these, you know, qualitative mental states into that picture? But in general, the, the, the methodological um, kind of blueprint is one where some goings on are, you know, stipulated uh as a working hypothesis um, operating or uh antagonistic or even a speculative hypothesis and then um one then goes to work okay so this is just kind of the first stage you say okay well let's see <laughs> suppose the cosmos is the one fundamental entity then what about all these uh sub parts of the, the cosmos these sub goings on how would they specifically stand to the cosmos in such a way as to make sense of you know what we believe the sci you know scientific claims and so on uh, or suppose the you know lower level physical goings on are the only fundamenta then uh, how do we make sense of these chemical goings on okay that's not a problem what about these other these mental goings on slightly trickier some think anyway so that's uh, the stipulation, I think, to the extent that it is stipulation. It's just, you know, kind of like in the sciences where you just take a hypothesis on board as a working antagonistic or speculative supposition, and then you, you know, see, <laughs> see what you can do with that. But stipulation or, you know, the hypothesis itself is not driving the metaphysical train. Um, the, these investigations will typically suppose or presuppose that there's a metaphysical fact of the matter about what is, you know, fundamental or comparatively fundamental, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, I agree with the sort of the practices that, that you're pointing out in, in, in metaphysics. I just, I'm pretty skeptical of the view that, you know, there is a metaphysical fact of the matter about which is really fundamental. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I don't have a problem with, you know, okay, these are the things we're calling fundamental, you know, the cosmos, it's called Shaffer, yeah. you know, or whatever the things you're talking about. And then from there, um, drawing inferences as you would otherwise do on the basis of that sort of stipulation. But yeah, again, yeah. I wouldn't say that my stipulation is getting at any metaphysical truth. We could have had we so prefer stipulated the whole world or something else as, as fundamental proceeding from there and or just dispense with this talk altogether um 
I guess, what, what do you think of this sort of skeptical or deflationary or maybe pluralistic approach to, to metaphysical theorizing of this sort? Well, um, I think, you know, that's certainly a view that one can hold. Um, it's not one that I'm particularly drawn to. Um, as, as I see it, uh, as I was kind of mentioning earlier, the supposition of metaphysical structure is really ubiquitous in the sciences. So you open up, for example, any physics textbook and it will, you know, like Feynman, everything is made of atoms or, you know, there's four fundamental forces, they serve as the basis for all the other goings on, et cetera. Um, in these various religious traditions, you look at those religious traditions, you know, uh, Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, et cetera, they're, you know, presupposing that there are certain fundamenta or a fundamentum, and then the other goings on depend in various interesting ways on the fundamentum or the fundamenta. And in philosophical context, of course, you see this again, ubiquitously, you know, Barclay uh, presupposes that minds and ideas are the fundamental goings on, and then everything else gets cached in interesting ways in terms of those, or Spinoza assumes that God is the one fundamentum, uh, and everything else is a mode in this, this one entity and so on. So I see these as these case studies, these um, are tracking what seem to me to be appearances of commitment to metaphysical structure. So um, I like those, uh, I like those those investigations, and um, I want to try to make sense of them. So I see my job really uh, qua metaphysician of metaphysical or metaphysician investigating into metaphysical structure, um, not so much as trying to convince some, you know, a skeptic or someone who uh, is is attracted to a deflationary pluralist view. Um, you know, bring them on my side. I just, or not, I, I'm not trying to knock them off their horse. I'm just trying to stay on my own horse, so to speak, and try to make sense of what seemed to me the, to be the appearances, the prima facie appearances of metaphysical structure, which drive interest in fundamentality and dependence in the first place. Yeah, yeah, f fair enough. I guess, like on my approach, the way I would understand that is that these people have commitments to what is fundamental. And then from that, they can um, infer various structures. Um, but again, the the commitment there is, I take it to more of a, a stipulate. I mean, they might believe that it's a fact of the matter, but I'm I'm personally skeptical that, the, that it would be. Um, because especially if, I, if we're comparing two views, which are, you know, people agree on the, um, uh, like the ontology, I suppose mm -hmm. people think that, you know, the world roughly described by physics is the world in which you live. Um, and, you know, you have someone who thinks that ah, the fundamental goings on are, are um, the microphysical states of affairs and someone else says they're the uh, fundamental, the fundamenta is the, the whole cosmos. I'm, I don't really think this, I'm skeptical that there's a real substantive dispute there, so long as they don't have a um, a notion of fundamentality, which would um, provide some criteria for deciding between them. Well, the criteria will be once, I think this speaks to the overall um, background methodology of these investigations, you know, it's broadly abductive, right? So if you think about Schaffer's uh, paper, um, monism, the priority of the whole, you know, he's, he's bringing into play lots of con many considerations, you know, that it's, you know, this view is makes sense of entanglement phenomena, or it makes better sense than certain other views or atomist, broadly atomist views of, you know, this or that it's more, it's ontologically more parsimonious at the level of the fundamenta and so on. So, you know, there are considerations that are brought to bear um, to try to make the case one way or another that we have, you know, motivations to go one way, you know, for monism as opposed to atomism. Now, I don't think, I personally, I don't think he makes that case, but um, I'm friend friendly to the idea that abductive considerations can support 
uh, one general hypothesis over another. And I think that's basically how science proceeds. Um, really, science is not getting anywhere without the usual metaphysical presuppositions of the sort that, you know, metaphysical structure is uh, kind of encoding. So um, under those circumstances, I'd have to see reason to think that our, our ob broadly abductive methodology, which is characteristic not just of metaphysics or philosophy, but also of the sciences and much of ordinary experience is somehow you know, foundationally flawed such that we will never be in any position to um, you know, differentiate or, or order different approaches. Now, if you know, there are skeptics about abduction, but you know, uh, that's, a, that's another, another ball of wax, I guess. I want to say most scientists, most philosophers are pretty happy to think that abduction can provide some kind of insight. Now, or confirmation or disconfirmation. Now, of course, at this stage of metaphysical and also scientific inquiry, we're really, uh, things are method methodologically, uh, to some extent, unsettled. You know, we don't necessarily have, uh, uh, we don't have, in fact, agreement about, you know, what are the, abduct precisely what are the abductive virtues, um, what are the proper weightings? We don't have agreement about uh, additional sorts of considerations which enter into theorizing, like, you know, which fundamental theses should we accept? Should we accept Hume's dictum or not, for example? Mm. Right? So just to go back to the, um, the play between the monist and the animist, for example, the animist could respond to Schaffer and say, well, look, you know, I like Hume's dictum. I think that there are no metaphysically necessary connections between distinct existences. And so I need my, my parts to be freely modally recombinable. So, you know, animism provides you with a nice way of saying, okay, the fundamenta are these free, freely modally recombinable goings on, whereas Javert just has the one fundamentum. So he doesn't have the same, you know, it, there's not a natural sense of, of uh, you know, how you would, implement a broadly Humean modal metaphysics given a uh, background monist view. That's not to say he couldn't, there's not things for him to say, but on the face of it, an animist view more naturally accommodates uh, certain, you know, broadly Humean presuppositions about the nature of the fundamenta. So, you know, then we have to turn our attention to Hume's dictum and say, well, sh should we accept that or not? There's an enormous amount of complexity, you know, with respect to um, our methodological presuppositions, which makes up a lot of the interest of, you know, you know debate with um, within these communities. Uh, but you know, we're still, like I, I sometimes say, we're very far from the end of methodological inquiry. That said, I don't see any at this point. I don't see any reason for pessimism as regards you know, our ability to refine our understanding, to get clearer about which foundational uh, theses or um, presuppositions we should accept, um, you know, which weightings of abductive principles might be uh, more suited to accommodating more phenomena and so on and so forth. So I think all, all that is actually proceeding apace in a pretty nice way. I think in the last uh, in the last decades, last century, we made an enormous amount of progress in refining our methodological standards, both in philosophy and the sciences. So, right now, I don't see the the motivation for anti-realism or skepticism or you know uh, general deflationism about metaphysical inquiry into metaphysical structure in particular. Right, very good. So I guess the main idea is there that like while we do have some methods for deciding between different uh, accounts of what is fundamental based on, um, you know, our other metaphysical commitments or you know, abductive commitments and and so forth, and um, you know, there's there's more of a conversation to be had than um, well, this is my theory and that's the other, and there's no ways to to sort of 
prefer one or arbitrate between them. Is that, is that kind of the way you're going? Yeah, that, I, that yeah. sounds right. But look, I, I do want to admit that, like I said, we're far from the end of metaphysical inquiry. And in, in, in a way, one of my pet, <laughs> my pet peeves is that people are too quick to, um, you know, pronounce, as I, I sometimes say, you know, stop pronouncing, y'all. <laughs> we are not in position right now to, uh, you know, definitively uh, endorse, say, you know, Hume's dictum or you know, th this or that other thing. We should, we should, I think, be upfront about the broadly provisional nature of many of our philosophical theses for a bunch of reasons, but, you know, they are provisional. Now, that they are currently provisional, I think, again, does not mean that we uh, have not made progress or are not in position to, um, you know, warrantedly assert various sorts of claims. I mean, we um, have a lot of conditional knowledge, right? So, given Hume's dictum and given this other presupposition, given a primitive notion of metaphysical dependence and blah, 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 then what? You know, you can at least, uh, you can identify, you know, these conditional uh, assertions as true or not, broadly speaking, at this point, even if we're not able uh, to definitively discharge the antecedent of these conditionals. Conditional knowledge is still knowledge. Yeah, well, it's a knowledge about a conditional of a certain sort, right? <laughs> well, it's a con it's content. It has content, you know, given, right. yeah, given the truth of the antecedent then. Yeah, and you, and yeah. you mentioned, uh, we'll come back to some grounding stuff, but I think that's, that's you mentioned that's good. So you mentioned Hume's dictum there, and, and that's something you've talked about in a, at least a couple of different papers. And mm -hmm. um, and in your paper on on three dogmas of metaphysical methodology, that's that's one of the um, uh, assumptions you you discussed that's taken on a flimsy or or even non-existent basis. Um, and uh, roughly, it says there are no metaphysically necessary connections between distinct intrinsically typed entities. Yeah. First, I was just wondering, how, how exactly do we understand intrinsically typed here? And does the dictum just, on your view, turn out false um, when there are emergent phenomena for, for sure some necessary connection between it uh, and its base or that, that from which it emerges? Um, yeah, good. Um, with respect to intrinsic typing, this is uh, kind of a qualification on the application of Hume's dictum uh, so that it won't be um, immediately falsified, right? So there's actually quite um, a lot of uh, ambiguity in the claim that there are no necessary connections between distinct existences. You know, like what's the force of the necessity? What is it for the existences to be distinct and so on? But, it, you know, in the first instance, um, the distinctness has got to be one that uh, is going to prevent the application of Hume's dictum to, for example, something like a planet, where, you know, what it is to be a planet is to be an entity that is uh, circling a sun, let's just say, for the sake of argument. So um, the a planet in that sense is extrinsically typed in the sense that it's, you know, uh, its status as a planet, you know, being a planet is going to depend on the existence of this other entity. Okay. So in that case, a planet is going to be necessarily connected to a sun because that's what it is to be a planet is to be, you know, around hanging around a sun somehow or another. <laughs> so um, right. the initial, qualification of intrinsic typing is just meant to kind of restrict the purview of Hume's dictum in a way that leaves open its pos you know, its truth. And so how does that, um, the second part I, of my question was that like, uh, that presumably you can have some emergent phenomena, which is distinct from the thing 
uh, from which emer it emerges has some properties th th uh, that they don't share, for example. Um, is that a counterexample uh, to Hume's dictum, since the intrinsic work type is in the same way? Yeah, good. Uh, well, it will depend, I think, on the case. So emergence itself, um, I believe, admits of different varieties. So in the first instance, there's, uh, I have to go on a little bit of a tangent to kind of uh, preface my answer. But um, in my book, I argue that there are, uh, broadly speaking, two schemas for metaphysical emergence, where metaphysical emergence uh, combines these um, fe these two features, namely a kind of broadly synchronic or cotemporal dependence of some of the emergent on some lower level or base level goings on, uh, as well as a kind of autonomy, ontological and causal of the emergence of uh, emergent vis-a-vis -vis the, the, its base level goings on. And again, you know, there are these prima facie appearances of metaphysical emergence that are associated with, for example, special science entities vis-a-vis uh, -vis lower level complex aggregations of physical goings on and so on. Um, and then the question is, well, can we make sense of, say, the autonomy of special, the autonomy and the dependent you know, broadly synchronic dependence of special science goings on in a way that um, you know, doesn't give rise to problematic causal overdetermination of the sort that Kim has, has discussed um, and so on. And in my book, I argue that there's, there's two and really only two uh, schemas for metaphysical emergence that then can be instantiated in a whole bunch of different ways or Im implemented in a bunch of different ways. One of them is what I call weak emergence. And that's the sort of emergence that, say, a non-reductive physicalist would endorse. So non-reductive physicalist is someone who thinks that the only fundamental goings on are physical goings on. And um, Nonetheless, they're not reductive physicalists. They don't think that all, you know, the, the wonderful world of macroscopia and so on are identical to, say, complex aggregates or pluralities of physical goings on. They think, for example, you know, in, in at least some cases, maybe mental states or maybe even tables and chairs and, and, and the like, these, uh, non-fundamental goings on are distinct from any complex, even massively complex aggregates or disjunctions thereof of the lower level physical goings on, but they're completely metaphysically dependent on those lower level goings on. So the emergence, metaphysical emergence for the non-reductive physicalist requires that they, um, you know, give an account, make sense of how there can be this kind of complete metaphysical dependence of uh, the non-fundamental, uh, for example, special scientific goings on, on massively complex lower level physical goings on, and yet these special scientific goings on can still have a certain degree of ontological and causal autonomy. They can be distinct, in other words, and also distinctively efficacious. So that's one form of weak emergence, uh, one form of metaphysical emergence. Then there's another form, what I call strong emergence. There, this is a sort of emergence that if there were any, it would falsify physicalism on the supposition, you know, that uh, the compositionally basic entities are, are physical. So this is the sort that the British emergentists thought applied to, in particular, qualitative mental phenomena. And there are still strong emergentists of this variety, you know, in the contemporary context as well. So for these guys, the relation between uh, strong, the strongly emergent phenomena and the physical phenomena, there's still a kind of cotemporal dependence there, but it's not complete. It's partial one way or another. It can't be complete because if it was complete, then you wouldn't have something that was strongly emergent. You'd have something that was weakly emergent. Now the strong emergent then for the for the strong emergent I have this other you know component of my view for, uh, that characterizes these schemas 
for the strong emergentists, they're going to say the strong emergent has a um, new, at least one new power. It can cause something that its dependence base, physical base going on can't cause or can't cause in the same way. But now going back to the weak emergentist, they, uh, they cannot say that the weekly emergent phenomena have any new powers because as physicalists, they think the only powers in the world are physical powers, ultimately. Powers of perhaps massively complex physical goings on. Not We're not talking about individual atoms, but like comp massively complex lower level physical goings on provide a basis for all causal interaction in the world. So for the phys non-reductive physicalists, the weak emergent goings on don't have any new powers. They, but I argue they can still say that the weakly emergent phenomena are distinctively efficacious in having a proper subset of the powers of their dependent space entities. And then I give a story about why um, a distinctive power profile is good enough to have the kind of distinctive efficacy that is associated with metaphysical emergence. Okay, so that's the setup. Now, your question was, you know, uh, thinking about Hume's dictum and this question of whether there can be necessary connections between distinct existences. With the advent of um, emergent phenomena, immediately falsify Hume's dictum. Well, here is a case where, you know, like how you understand the notion of distinct entities in Hume's dictum will matter. Both the weak emergentist and the strong emergentist will agree that the emergent goings on are distinct from their massively complex physical base goings on. So they, they are distinct. But typically, Hume's dictum is applied not just to intrinsically characterized entities, but also to entities that are quote unquote wholly distinct, not just distinct, not just numerically distinct, but somehow wholly distinct. Like, for example, paradigmatically, they're spatio temporally non overlapping. That would be mm. one way to be wholly distinct. Now, for the weak emergentists, though, the non, the non reductive physicalists, they will not think that weak emergents are wholly distinct from their physical bases. In a way, they're, they're kind of like, you know, they're embedded in their physical bases. The strong emergentist, however, might think that a strong emergent was wholly distinct from their bases. Qualification, as per usual, a strong emergentist need not <laughs> does need not think that a strong emergent is wholly distinct from its base. But if they did think this, then that would falsify Hume's dictum. So that was a long answer, sorry about that. Right, so I guess, I mean, the charitable way would be, uh, a response uh, would be for them to um, rephrase it so that it wouldn't include these things as, as counterexamples. Um, but, uh, yeah, that 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 emergent phenomena being as distinct from their bases, but necessarily having some connection, uh, that wouldn't falsify the dictum if we. I guess we have to be more careful how it's stated or something like that. Well, this is just another. Uh, yeah, we do have to be careful of how Hume's dictum is stated. I mean, that will that will matter. So, in a book, I'm uh, sorry, a paper of mine called "What Is Hume's Dictum and Why I Believe It." I go through, um, you know, in kind of gory detail, a bunch of different options for understanding the constitutive content of Hume's dictum and considering like what, you know, uh, what it would say, whether uh, that content would support its truth and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, so this would be kind of a background assumption. Suppose I want to be a strong emergentist, but I also want to endorse Hume's dictum. Then I will presumably be fishing around for a way of understanding how a strong emergent might be partially spatio-temporally overlap or otherwise overlap with its uh, dependence base, but not entirely um, overlap so that there was, you know, it would be kind of a, yeah, um, some partial but not complete overlap. 
So that would be compatible with Hume's dictum. But then, the, you know, the further question is, well, I think the deeper question is, well, should we accept Hume's dictum as foundational or metaphysical theorizing? You mentioned earlier the idea that it, um, may, you know, I might have suggested that it's not, well, I, I can't remember the word you used, maybe <laughs> is it motivated on flimsy grounds or something. Right. I, just, I just want to say, I my view is, is rather that, um, you know, contemporary proponents of Hume's dictum don't themselves offer good reasons for believing it. I think if you're Hume, you have good reasons to believe Hume's dictum. So, you know, there are grounds out there for Hume's dictum if you believe, for example, that, you know, all content and justification is based on, you know, and, uh, you know, co constituted by these comparatively superficial sense impressions. So somebody like Hume, you know, he had good reason to accept Hume's dictum. So my question is like, look, if you're not Hume, if you think that inference to the best explanation is, you know, um, a mode of inference in good standing, if you think that, you know, there's more to the content of our beliefs than just kind of the superficial sense impressions that are copied into our ideas and, um, you know, combinatorially met, uh, mixed and mashed and so on, if you, if you, and most proponents of Hume's dictum do not follow Hume in his strict empiricism, so then why would you accept it? That's the question. Right, right. So, he had motivation on the basis of his more general metaphysical or epistemological views, but um, people nowadays who don't share those views, at least not to, in the same, to the same extent, um, therefore lacked at least the motivation he had. So what is their motivation now? It seems to me exactly. that's the question you're bringing up. That's right. Very good. Um, I want to add another question here. You, you, you talked about the physical and um, we had uh, Daniel Stolzar uh, previously as a guest and, and he, among others, has long been um, skeptical that there is a notion of the physical, which is not trivially true, not obviously false, and deserving of the name. Uh, but you've been less pessimistic of, um, about this. So how do you think we can, or at least make, how do you think we can make progress on formulating the thesis? Yeah, um, well, uh, I'm friendly to what we, you might think of as a broadly physics-based approach to characterizing the physical. Um, but you know this that approach faces certain notorious difficulties you know to be sure so um you know one of the uh, one of my papers on characterizing the physical attempts to address those difficulties and and show that they can be answered um so just to kind of give you a sense of uh you know what a couple of the difficulties are and how my preferred account of the physical you know, aims to overcome them. Um, Hempel in, um, uh, I believe it was a talk, maybe at an APA or something like that, came up with what has been called uh, Hempel's dilemma. I wanted to say there's no characterization of what it is for some goings on to be physical that would make sense of, for example, physicalism, the thesis that all goings on are broadly physical, right? Why is that? Because look, if you've got a physics-based account of what it is to be physics, the physical, right? Well, we know that physics is incomplete and we, well, more than that, we know it's, it's false given that it, the two foundational theories are inconsistent at this point. So it's inaccurate and incomplete. So we can't look to contemporary or present day physics to you know, provide us with a handle on which goings on are physical. But so in that case, if we, if we did do so, if we fed that conception of the physical into our physicalist thesis, then physicalism would turn out to be trivially false, okay? 
Well, how about then if we, and the other horn of the dilemma is that you look to, you know, future ideal physics as a way of characterizing what, which goings on are going to turn out to be physical. But then the concern is there's kind of two, two sorts of concerns. One concern is that physics will just swallow up everything and everything will end up being treated by physics. I don't think that concern is really uh, too pressing because, you know, physics is sort of uh, definitively, in my view, it's definitively understood as, as sort of the study of the, you know, rel of relatively fundamental goings on, goings on that are a certain kind of level of, uh, n you know, complexity, rel relatively non-complex goings on, and then aggregations thereof. But the deeper problem with appealing to future physics as a way of characterizing the physical is that, you know, it leaves open that physicists will posit some kind of goings on that are intuitively, you know, not physical, <laughs> or which would, if if there were any, intuitively it would falsify physicalism. So, for example, if phys physicists were to, um, you know, future physicists would posit so fundamentally mental goings on of the sort that the panpsychist endorses, right? Then you know, a physics-based characterization of the physical would seem to, you know, deem those physical, yet intuitively th such entities should be in should not be deemed physical because feeding that into physicalism would produce a view that most people would think is incompatible with physicalism. So my strategy for, um, for responding to uh, Hempel's dilemma well, in brief, I, with respect to this latter most pressing problem is to impose a kind of no fundamental mentality constraint. Um, so, you know, our characterization of the physical, we, we're going to look to physics to give us a handle, an extensional handle on which goings on are, you know, the compositionally basic entities. Uh, but... We don't hand over all authority to the physicists to tell us which goings on are physical. If some, if physics were to posit, fun, you know, fundamental particles that are conscious, then those entities would not be, should not be considered physical. So I have a, a kind of uh, what physics-based account of the phys physical, which incorporates a no fundamental mentality constraint in effect. So, um, yeah, that's, that's more or less my view. Yeah. So some, some goings on would be physical just in case they are uh, approximately accurately treated by present or in the future of inquiry, um, ideal uh, physics, and they are not fundamentally mental. And I think this is what most physicalists have had in mind uh, in offering their, their view. Uh, their thesis, and it, you know, as I say, I think it, it can be made to sidestep Hempel's dilemma. All right, that's that's good. And 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 another potential issue with the ideal physics-based approach, though, is that isn't it that um, we could be okay, not not with respect to the mind case because we're building the no fundamentality about mind, but we could be fundamentally mm -hmm. wrong about what the physical things are. I mean, our, our present theories might be um, not just somewhat incorrect. I mean, we know that, the, that, that there are certain falsehoods in them, but like radically incorrect. Um, and I mean, I guess maybe some people take that as a, a, a challenge to this way to understand physicalism, or is that not an issue for you? Or how would you think about that? No, I think that's a good point. And um... I, I do think that there has to be some kind of supposition that physics is getting it approximately right, at least at some level of abstraction, since otherwise, what are we even talking about? So right. I think your, your question is, your point is a good one. All right, that makes sense. Um, yeah, so I take it you've defended a sort of 
powers subset based account of emergence. And so roughly speaking, um, how do I put this? X is a um, emergent from, or X is weakly emergent from Y. Um, if, um, if X synchronically depends on Y and X's powers are a proper subset of Y's powers, um, and X is strongly emergent if X synchronically depends on Y, but has like novel powers that Y doesn't have. And from this, you can get causal and other relations between emergent phenomena um, distinct from lower level causation or whatever. Um, if causation is sensitive in the right way to, you know, power profiles of, of the lot in this way. Is it, uh, do I have this roughly right? And, and maybe you could expand briefly on this approach to, to uh, emergence. Yeah. Um, yeah, you do have it roughly right. I think I would only qualify that um, for me, you know, the idea of um, causation, you know, causation, one thing causing another in a way is too coarse grained. So I prefer to think in terms of, you know, some goings on being distinctively efficacious and then uh, to argue that there are two ways for, you know, some higher, in the case of emergence, some higher level property or entity to be distinctively efficacious vis-a-vis -a, -vis a given effect. And, you know, one of these, the most common way of thinking, you know, when people say, oh, yeah, how are you going to be distinctively efficacious? And this is a sort of, you know, understanding of distinctive efficacy that Kim has in mind is that you had to have your own new power, right? So, you know, a, one way to be distinctively efficacious vis-a-vis efficacious -vis your uh, co-temporal dependence base entity or feature is that you have a power that it doesn't have. So that's strong emergence. And then the other way, one which I think Kim didn't appreciate is for the emergent to have a proper subset, effectively to, not to have more powers, but to have fewer powers associated with it than its dependence base entity or feature. So the second form of distinctive efficacy is one where a higher level entity, let's just say, um, well, let's just focus on features because that's the, like a property or so on, like a mental property or me mental event um, or state. Um, it, if you're talking about weak emergence, the sort that, the non-reductive physicalist will accept on the assumption that the base level entities are physical, they will think that uh, there, there's the, um, the weak emergent does not cause anything that its dependence space goings on does not also cause. So I just want to clarify that Distinctive efficacy doesn't always require that you cause something that, you know, your base entity doesn't or base entity or feature. What it requires is that you can cause something in a different way, right? So that's what's going on with the proper subset of powers, uh, understanding of weak emergence. So there, um, the weak emergence emergent can be distinctively efficacious, not in virtue of having a new power, because if it had a new power, that would falsify, falsify physicalism. All powers are ultimately physical powers. But rather, in that that distinctive power profile of having you know, fewer powers than your dependent space entity is tracking difference-making considerations, for example, or it might be tracking uh, if you think about the special sciences as kind of uh, more abstract, right, than the lower level fundamental physical sciences, tracking comparatively abstract causal joints in nature or comparatively abstract systems of laws, those distinctive power profiles are tracking these more abstract causal joints, according, you know, to my understanding of weak emergence or non-reductive physicalism. Right. I, I, fair enough. I mean, yet one way that I think we might get to this conclusion also is that 
um, there's this principle of regarding the proportionality of cause, uh, causes to effects that um, like Stephen Yablo has suggested, right? That the causes are, should be specific enough and not more specific than what's required to produce the effect. And maybe if we think of that in terms of, um, in terms of like the powers that something has, well, something with enough powers, but not more than that in order to produce the effect will count as, as the cause of that. I mean, is that, does that seem plausible to you or? Would you well, actually, that? Troy, I will resist that understanding of, you know, the distinctive efficacy, because I don't want it to be the case that the weak emergent can cause anything that its base level entity can't cause. So this kind of approach right. to distinctive efficacy is not one that follows Yablo or Shoemaker, for that matter, who sometimes suggests something similar, you know, according to which you know, the distinctive power profile is such that it renders the weak emergent a better candidate for being the cause than its lower level base. I find that to be in tension with physicalism. So I don't want to say that. I just So, so they're both causes, but what they cause in different ways. That's the idea. Exactly. Yeah. You, you still consider that a sort of over determination or? Yeah, I would. Is at the is level of powers, well, they share, right. well, all right, let me say, let me back off on that a little bit. The idea is that they share a power, a token power. The weak emergent has this power and it is token identical with the power of its physical base entity or feature. So they both, you know, there's just one power there. So it's not over determination in the sense of there being, you know, two type um two different tokens of a single type of power or something it's one and the same right. token power that gets exercised on a given occasion but um the uh, you know the uh mental or sorry the weak emergent is distinctively efficacious notwithstanding that it doesn't have any new power in virtue of having this distinctive power profile which is tracking these you know, difference making considerations or abstract levels of causal grain. So, for example, just to, you know, it, it might be useful to think about a specific case. For example, if I have, uh, you know, a men I'm, men my mental state of being thirsty, let's say it completely depends on some physical brain state or some lower level. Uh, fundamental physical state, massively complex physical state, and my mental state of feeling thirsty uh, causes me to reach for the glass of water, you know, that particular causal interaction, that, that the exercise of that power, you know, I want to say that is token identical with the exercise of a power of this lower level fundamental physical uh, aggregate or plurality, whatever it is. Right, so there's no overdetermination with respect to the exercise of this ultimately fundamental physical power, but um, where there is overdetermination is that they are both they could be both considered causes. You know, one is a cause of the the reaching in a way that is tracking these kind of difference making considerations. So if I had if my mental state of being thirsty had been realized by a different physical state. Not when not too different, but a little bit different, I would have still reached for the glass of water. Whereas, you know, something else would have happened if, you know, the usual physical effect would not, not the precise physical effect would not have occurred. Right. Yeah, that, that much makes sense. Um, it does still seem a little bit, a bit strange, but. To think that, um, yeah, okay, it's not it's one token power that's sort of producing the effect, but all the same, there are multiple entities which have that token power, even because they're overlapping, maybe in some way. Yeah. Um, Good. So it's a, a sort of overdetermination, but that's not the end of the story because you have this difference between um, the ways in which things uh, produce the effects and so forth. Yeah, good. Um, and it's not just a just a um, 
fill in just a tiny bit. It's not over to if there if there's over determination there, it's not over determination of the firing squad variety or whatever that right. would be problematic. So yes, it's just over determination and then the sense that there's multiple things which count as the cause, um, distinct entities in a way. Yeah. Um, but they sort of share the same power in, in a way that um, people two um, people with a gun have don't have the same power. They're not really sharing. Exactly. Yeah. Good. Good. I had another question about um, fundamentality that I probably should have gotten to earlier. Um, and on the issue of whether, um, so in response to the suggestion that there might not be a fundamental level, because like, that mm. seems to be a problem, a potential problem, like because if you're understanding priority and, and so forth in terms of what is fundamental, um, and if there really isn't anything which is fundamental, because there's no fundamental level, um, then presumably we can't understand our priority. You've suggested that we could nevertheless in some way um, fix what is fundamental at some point in order for uh, to enable that theorizing. Um, but how, how do we determine what that point is? I mean, for example, we don't want to say that um, we fix it at the point at which more fundamental things are fundamental things are irrelevant or don't have some property since until we fix what we're calling fundamental, there's no fact of the matter concerning what is more or less fundamental. Um, so how, how would we approach this issue of determining what is fundamental if, you know, for the sake of theorizing if there's no fundamental level? Yeah. Um, yeah, good. So this is, you know, this is a pressing concern about my view is like, uh, what if there's no fundamental level? You know, how if, if I am giving an account of, priority fixing according to which, you know, the primitive specification, not stipulation, but the primitive specification by the world of what is fundamental um, fixes the direction of priority, what happens if there's no fundamental level? So before I say, um, you know, what my, my preferred sort of strategies are for addressing that concern, I just wanted to fill in a little bit of, of how this is supposed to work. Uh, by reference to this case study that we mentioned earlier, um, you know, somebody who thinks like to Jonathan Schaffer that the cosmos is fundamental, and then some, like the atomist who thinks that the part, you know, the the basic parts, the atoms, let's say, they're fundamental. The atomist and the monist can agree that the part-whole relation, the classical muriological part-whole relation, holds between the atomic parts and the cosmos. What they disagree about is, you know, which direction the priority runs in that particular instance of, you know, or the instances of the part-whole relation. So, um, you know, that kind of case is the one that sort of suggests that we need, you need some way to, um, you need something in addition to just the small g relations like part-whole or functional realization or whatever. In or uh, to you know have them serve as metaphysical dependence relations, indicating a direction of priority in a given case. Now, let me just qualify that I think some metaphysical dependence relations don't indicate a direction of priority. So, for example, if you are a Huyan Buddhist and you think that all the you know there's just one level of fundamental entities, all of which are interdependent, you could say that they are metaphysically dependent and they're all at the same level of priority. So just to, just to clarify and qualify, I don't think that anytime you have a metaphysical dependence relation, you thereby then would have a relation of priority with one you know uh, side of the relation being less fundamental than the other. However, there are many cases where uh, metaphysical dependence relations do Come associated, you know, or they're supposed to be associated with a certain direction of relative fundamentality or priority. And so, for those cases, I want to suggest that we can, uh, we don't have to, you know, have there be a kind of primitive pointer, as the big G grounder would say, but rather what we need is a primitive specification of what is fundamental. And again, to illustrate by our case, if you if the cosmos is the one fundamental entity, then 
um, you it will then immediately follow as a metaphysical matter of fact that the parts of the cosmos are non-fundamental. Whereas if the atoms, the atomic, you know, most basic parts, if they are the only fundamental goings on, again, as a primitive worldly matter, then it will follow that fusions of those uh, fundamental parts are um, non-fundamental. So that's just one illustration of how the primitive worldly specification of which, which goings on are fundamental combined with a small g relation eventuates in a, a direction of priority for that token of that, for that instance of the relation, okay? It's not saying that any instance of part whole, say if the cosmos is fundamental, the, co the monist can allow that the, um, the part, the legs of a table are prior to the table as a whole. So the parthood relation can have different directions of priority in the different instances on my view, and also on the big G grounder view, because you know, which direction big G grounding points in a given case, maybe in this case a part whole, it points in, from whole to part, and in this other case, it points from part to whole. And I also uh, have a story about how that can be. So that was just background to kind of fill in, um, you know, how my account, my fundamental fundamentality first account work is supposed to work. In the first instance, the primitive specification coupled with small g relations between the non, you know, that will, that will fix what goings on are non-fundamental vis-a-vis the primitively specified fundamental entities. And then if you want to try and figure out priority among the non-fundamenta, you have to look at the specific accounts, small g accounts of those non-fundamenta and say, okay, is there a priority relation here? And if not, what is, it? you know, uh, if not, or yeah. If there is, which direction does it point? Now, now I can address your question, which is uh, this was something Schaffer pressed in in our interactions. Uh, you know, on this topic, he said, "Well, what if there's no fundamental level? Then you don't have a way of saying, you know, of making sense of any priority relations." So I had a cup. I had, I think, a three part response at, at that point. But the the kind of the responses that I um, kind of, I, I don't think, uh, I would not say that we should just pick a level and just have, have that serve as a fundamental base, because I agree with you, that's not really, uh, that's not principled. So the, the kind of principled responses are as follows. The first one says, even if there's no fundamental level, so long as there's convergence on a fundamental level that will serve for purposes of metaphysically fixing the direction of priority. So if it were the case that there was, you know, just like in a case of mathematical convergence um, on a limit, even if that limit is never reached, still, if there's convergence on a fundamental level where things just get smaller, for example, smaller and smaller and smaller, but they converge to this certain kind of limit, that would still be a joint in nature. So what I need is a joint in nature. And convergence on a limit fundamental level, even if it's never actually instanti instantiated, that would, you know, I believe, um, serve as a principal joint that would enable direction of priority to be fixed. So that's one, I think, I think I like that strategy for making sense of priority relations, even in the absence of a fundamental. But what if, you know, the fundamental level, whatever it is, doesn't converge in this way? Well, in that case, I'm going to bite the bullet and say, okay, then there's no priority relations. So the way I think about this as a, you know, kind of an acceptable bullet to bite is you can think about the fundamental goings on as being those that, you know, are all God had to create. So God comes in, for example, if you're a physicalist, you think God came in, threw down the physical goings on, and then God can check out. Or, you know, 
if you're, you have different stories about what the fundamental goings on are, nonetheless, you know, there's this heuristic, <laughs> you know, way of kind of characterizing the fundamental as the starting points for all else out of world. But if there really is no fundamental level, then it seems to me that what the heuristic predicts is that God has to create the whole world. But then if God had to create the world, whole world, there really is no distinction between what's fundamental and non-fundamental. So those are my two favored responses to the concern, but I'm trying to think of other ones as well. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. And I mean, and then you could definitely say that, um, okay, that's, that, that's a bullet to bite potentially, but yeah. you might think it's unlikely that it would get to that point. First of all, that there is no fundamental level and that um, even if there wasn't, there wouldn't converge in this way that you, you described. Um, yeah, and you know, what's kind of uh, amusing is that Schaffer himself thinks that there has to be a fundamental level in order for priority relations to be fixed. Interesting, uh, so on, hmm, even though his account doesn't involve like a primitive specification of what is fundamental, uh, you need you need that in order to have priority relations at all. Well, you know, I don't think he has to maintain this, but he has put it this way: he has maintained in the past that mm. you know there had that didn't make sense for there not to be a fundamental level and there to be priority relations. Fair enough. Um, Once what? You have big G grounding you. That you know, this, this you might think is one clear advantage for the big G grounders because they can make sense of priority relations clearly, you know, very easily in the absence of a fundamental level. So he doesn't have to say <laughs> he doesn't have. Maybe he changed his mind about this. I don't know. But at some point, he he was on record as as suggesting that there had to be a fundamental level. There was going to be this kind of priority relation. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, I wanted to get to a few other questions. One sort of a general question about um, metaphysical modality. Um, and I was wondering if this is something you've thought about. Is, is, it, is this a primitive notion for you or are there so-called principles or axioms of metaphysics given which the modal status of some metaphysical claim is fixed? Um, if so, um, what do you think these principle are, principles are, or, or how might we discover them? It's like by metaphysical theorizing or something else. Yeah, it's a very interesting question, and um, you know, I don't, I don't have a, a kind of firm view as regards uh, this, but I, I'll just register my intuition that it is not primitive, and that but also that it does not metaphysical modality is neither primitive nor does it nor do i think there are kind of principles or axioms of metaphysics uh whereby the modal status of some metaphysical claim is fixed um at least not unless those principles of metaphysics are something reflecting kind of the nature of the entity at issue i would i suppose i think and again i'm just speculate you know kind of talking off the top of my head here about this this interesting issue um i'm inclined to think that you know the natures of entities are prior to uh you know the modal facts so to speak they generate the modal modal facts and so the modal facts themselves would not be primitive on that view right yeah i mean this is a complicated issue and it's, it's a lot of different views that you could explore but um so I, think I know there's definitely a lot of people that take it as just primitive and say there's nothing really more to be said about it but I've, yeah. I've always found that to be kind of mysterious <laughs> I agree I agree and you know I guess you know this is something I really should uh, think more about um but for example uh, I have argued that you know there are certain constitutive modal facts that are associated with determinables, you know, determinable, 
maximal features such as, you know, being red or, or something that are not maximally determinate, such that, you know, if it's a constitutive modal fact about a given determinable instance of a determinable property or feature that it could have been uh, determined by a different determinant, right? So it's, a, it's constitutive of a, of a given token of red that um, it is of a type, more precisely, it is of a type that could have been otherwise determined. So this, this token of red was determined by scarlet, but red is of a type that an instance of red might have been determined by, say, burgundy or something like that. So those are the sort of modal facts that I think enter into, um, they enter into the nature of features. And I think they also enter into persistence conditions. You know, so how, why is it the case that I can survive certain changes or this table can survive certain changes and so on? I feel like, um, you know, again, the the natures of the entities are kind of pushing the modal facts around, not vice versa. Right. That, I definitely agree with the. I think some of the thing, things you said there about about persistence and and the conditions and and so forth. Um, and and when you talk about determinables and determinants, you've also uh, talked about how there could be metaphysically indeterminate states of affairs, um, for example, with respect to the boundaries of various objects, or I think you talked about the open future, maybe other things. Um, and you've argued for a, a terminal, determinable based object level account. Um, I guess I, maybe if you could expand on this briefly, but I mean, personally, perhaps naively, I think there's a sense in which objects are indeterminate with respect to certain facts, i.e. Um, there's no fact of the matter regarding whether a, a cloud includes a particular mo molecule near the border, but determine it with respect to the properties that the state of affairs has qua cloud, right? Um, since the cloud doesn't necessarily entail a, a property of that sort, having that uh, molecule or not. Um, yeah. So can you describe your approach and, and does my above thought make any sense to you or, or <laughs> this is my... I want to say, I think that's a very interesting view that you just re expressed. Um, that's not my, that's not my view, but I think that's very interesting when you, you know, the idea that there could be, you know, facts, certain facts in the matter associated with some goings on, but, uh, maybe lacking facts that matter, um, at other levels of specification. That's, that's very cool. That's a cool right. view. Now, my view though, is that is one according to which, um, you know, again, I'm not ruling that out of you such and source, but this is just one way to make sense of, you know, some cases that I've looked at on my, on my determinable pa uh, based approach to metaphysical indeterminacy, there's no indeterminacy at the level of facts or propositions. So, you know, this, this fact of the matter talk, there's facts of the matter about, you know, every given claim on my view. And so an advantage of, of that is that you don't have to depart from classical logic or semantics. And um, I don't need to introduce, you know, an indeterminacy operator. I don't have to, you know, embrace something like supervaluationism or degree theoret degrees of truth or anything like that. Everything just remains perfectly classically the same. And rather the metaphysical indeterminacy you know, as treated on my approach, rather involves a certain kind of pattern of instantiation of determinable and determinate properties or features. So um, I kind of, uh, you know, motivate the, the view by attention to this case of an in, uh, uh, iridescent feather. So here's, an, you know, color is supposed to be a paradigmatic uh, case of determinable and determinate relation. I was just talking about red and scarlet, for example. So red's a determinable, scarlet's a determinate. Red, the determinable can be, you know, determined by different, more specific shapes. Now, a, and usually, sorry, just to backtrack, usually it's supposed that anytime you have an instance of a determinable property, you have one and only one 
maximal determinant of that determinable. So, you know, here's an instance of red. Well, um, you know, it, it can't be both determined at the same level by both scarlet and burgundy. Just one, you know, has to be uniquely determined. However, I argue that um, that's not general, that's not necessarily true or it's not generally characteristic of determinables and determinants. And the case of an iridescent feather is a case where um, the feather is colored, right? Uh, but depending on the perspective, and you can think of these as like subjective or objective perspectives, you're not building in necessarily any mentality to this, this thing, it can be, have to do with spatial rays. But relative to certain perspectives, there, the feather is blue and relative to others, it's red, let's say. And this is you know, a, not a matter of just seeing part of the feather, it has to do with interference phenomena and so on. So that's a case where there's a determinable instance, namely cut being colored, the feather is colored, but it is not uniquely determined. There's no one specific shade of red that the, the feather is, or that determines that determinable of color. Rather, the determinants are relativized. So that's a case of what I call multiple relativized determination. So sometimes there can be an instance of a determinable, and then there's too many uh, candidate determinants to just attribute, you know, one and only one of those determinants to the object. So that's a case where you have a determinable that is not uniquely determined. And then another way that that can happen is if you have an instance of a determinable and there's no determinants at all that are available to be, you know, to, to determine that determinable. And certain quantum phenomena, for example, might be thought to uh, be cases in point. So there might be a certain determinable associated with Schrodinger's cat, but, you know, there just aren't, the determinants have not, they don't, you know, they're not instantiated to be even candidate relativized determinants of that life status of the cat. So I looked at, you know, I took those kinds of cases and um, I uh, constructed an account of metaphysical determinacy around this idea that um, a state of affairs can involve an object's having a determinable property, but no unique determinant of that determinable, right? And so in the case of a boundary of an object, for example, you're talking about, uh, you know, how do we make sense of the table? It has a kind of indeterminate boundary. There, my story will be that the table has a determinable boundary property and, um, you know, it does not have a unique one and only one determinant of that determinable that is properly attributed to it in unrelativized fashion. So you, it will just turn out to be true. So to get back to this question of fact of the matter, um, you know, consider a certain specific boundary that contains one, you know, some molecule that you're interested in. This specific boundary, um, it, it will be true of the table that it has a determinable boundary property, but for every specific boundary, it will be false that it has that boundary. No, no maximally precise boundary will be truly attributed to the table unless you relativize or something else. I mean, there's, uh, you can relativize, but that's, you know, in unrelativized fashion, the table does not have a unique uh, maximally determinate boundary. So that's my, you know, that's one application of my, uh, determinable based account of metaphysical indeterminacy. Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting. I, I'd have to um, think about it some more to, to fully understand it. I'm not sure that um, <laughs> not sure that I quite get it, but um, I think I, I mostly get it in things. It sounds interesting. Yeah. interesting I, yeah, I apologize. It's a little bit, you know, no, no <laughs> technical apparatus back there, but but the basic idea is that we can understand a lot of, and then I argue that for all these different cases of metaphysical indeterminacy, including like quantum indeterminacy and open future and so on, 
we can fit that those into this pattern, you know, where there's some state of affairs that has a determinable feature, but no unique determinant of that feature. And then some of those cases will be one, like I said, there's too many candidates on the scene and other cases will be ones where there aren't any uniquely. So um, th that's the big propositional indeterminacy, you know, no uh, third truth values, no indeterminacy operator, classical logic and semantics gets to just stay as it is. Metaphysical indeterminacy on this view is just a matter of a certain kind of instantiation of properties with which we're already familiar. All right, fair enough. I just I have a, a couple more questions, and then we can wrap up. Is that good for you, time wise? Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. So you had a paper on um, where you discussed a, a regress argument against Cartesian skepticism, and you know, roughly speaking, you conclude that the skeptical views, which may lead to skepticism in the first place, undermine that same skepticism. In other words, skepticism is an unstable position. Um, this seems uh, fair enough to me, but I, I would still say that when we talk about what we are justified in believing, given various skeptical and epistemological principles, we we can do so while denying those principles or assumptions. So I mean, maybe if if, if justific justification can be contextual in this way, then perhaps I'm just I can be justified in my belief that given various epistemological principles, I'm not justified in any beliefs at all. Um, what do you think about this? And more generally, do you find the uh, plausible the approach to epistemology of, of DeRose and others, according to which the truth of, of attributions of knowledge or justification depends on features of the context in which the attribution is made? No, let me just start by saying, though, that, um, you know, the result I argue for is a little bit more restricted than you might think. I'm not arguing, I don't argue that any skeptical view is unstable, but just Cartesian skepticism. Okay, so right. just to qualify, because that, um, that I think that makes a difference to whether a kind of contextual approach would be useful, right? So maybe a contextual approach to justification or knowledge can't, you know, uh, can serve for some cases of skept, you know, can can serve as an adequate treatment of some cases of skepticism. But what I was trying to do was just consider whether, um, in a context where you are taking seriously the Cartesian uh, scenarios, right, would you thereby be unjust unjustified in asserting that the external world existed? So, um, you know fix the context and then there's still the remaining question, you know, taking those principles, taking the scenario seriously, should we, you know, in that context be external world skeptics? And then I argued no. And basically the idea is that the, uh, the skeptical scenarios uh, also apply to our mental states, right? So even Descartes thought that, Somebody could be mistaken about whether they believe something. You know, similarly with the dream argument, I have had, you know, you have a dream where you believe something that you don't really believe or you desire something that you don't really desire. So, you know, if those kinds of considerations are supposed to motivate skepticism, you know, about your perceptions, right, of the external world, they should also motivate skepticism about whether you are genuinely skeptical about the external world or whatever right so that's how the regress gets started is by taking seriously the principles that are accepted in that context and showing that they in fact undercut themselves because you then you're off on a you know it, it's unstable you can't be in a, a stable state because at each step you become skeptical about something that at the next step the same considerations should cause you to, to like uh, take back what you asserted at the previous step. Right, right, and we, you know, that, that definitely makes sense. Yeah, that's helpful. So we definitely even be skeptical. Um, we wouldn't be justified in our belief that we don't have knowledge of the external world as well. I mean, maybe all yeah. these things like that um, we wouldn't have. 
justification for um presumably maybe anything apart from the fact what that we exist or that we're that thinking exists maybe that's that's on that cartesian view that's maybe all we could get to uh, maybe <laughs> yeah maybe even not that uh, yeah <laughs> yeah i mean and, and then the, it's safe <laughs> <laughs> and then the second part was like yeah do you, what do you think of this uh like a contextualist approach to uh or a variant is supposed more generally to to knowledge or justification. Um, you know, I don't have a firm view. I think it might work in some some context. There's something that seems right about it, but there's also something that bothers me about the you know as it may ultimately hinge on you know what is it what are the relevant contexts and the determinants of the context and so on. It's maybe a little bit too anti-realist for my taste. Right, fair enough. Um, and on the last question I wanted to ask, I mean, I guess I had some more, but uh, I don't want to go, to, uh, go too long. You, ha you had a paper on discussing three barriers to philosophical progress, and, yes. uh, and there you discussed interdisciplinary siloing, sociological determinants and bias, and how those can restrict uh, philosophical progress in various ways. Um, and so I, I, of course, I agree that these are problems, um, but you know, the resolution doesn't always seem so obvious. Um, for one, so maybe some siloing can be advantageous since if we uh, spread our research so thin so as to become generalists, we may restrict the advancements we make on some specific advanced topic. Um, and this, this worry came up when talking to um, Julian and Virginia about the use of comparative philosophy. Um, do you agree that we have to strike some balance here between specificity and generality? And, and if so, how do we how do we go about finding that balance? Yeah, um, I just want to clarify that you know, like the interdisciplinary siloing is not really as I was understanding it, and in the cases that I was thinking about, um, was not so much about generalizing beyond a given topic to incorporate other topics, but rather just becoming familiar with other work on the same topic. So um, yeah. it was, you know, targeting things like, uh, you know, the case of of grounding, where a lot of work had been done on metaphysical dependence that, you know, some proponents of grounding seem not to be familiar with this work, notwithstanding that it was solidly on the topic at hand, right? And in, a, you know, we're not talking about having, you know, going outside our own discipline to look at this work. This is just, you know, massive amount of literature properly on topic. So uh, I... I'm not, you know, I don't think the answer to, or sort of the um, the uh, the fix to intradisciplinary siloing is necessarily going more general. It's just, in a way, going deeper into the one topic, whatever the topic at hand, whatever that is. Okay, so just to cl clarify about clarify that the suggestion is not that we should become generalists, but that we should become, in a way you know, just more familiar with a specific literature that is at issue. Um, as far yeah, okay. as, you see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's an important yeah. distinction. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, but um, I think that uh, there was something that you had said there. Uh, I About think- like comparative philosophy? Or yeah, that's right. And the use of comparative philosophy, um, a strict silence. Some, oh, here, this is what was uh, what I thought was very interesting to think about. Some siloing may be required to make certain advancements. I think that that is true, even if we bracket the issue about becoming generalists, but that just say, well, look, this, this is a way I put it in a different paper, actually, I considered a kind of variation on this question as a you know, potential objection, which is that, you know, sometimes some of the best work comes out of putting blinders on in a way 
and just very narrowly pursuing, you know, a kind of a restricted thesis, right? Or a certain, you know, when you think about the great medieval painters or something like that, you know, um, uh, becoming generalist in the sense of being non-dogmatic uh, might not always make room, or you might worry that it, if you, if if by becoming a generalist you mean something like, look, maybe if we're always uh, keeping our options open and not sort of being in a way, uh, if not dog dogmatic, at least kind of focused on one specific topic then or thesis. And that might, you know, be, that might have some negative uh, impact on, you know, the, the results that can be the fruit, the fruit of uh, dedicated commitment to a certain thesis. So I think there's something absolutely right about that. And, you know, it is, um, is, that's a, it's a, you know, it's just a good point. What I, what I think though, is that even if we, um, you know, we want to commit ourselves, we still have to be aware of the, at present, broadly provisional nature of our theses and so on. I'm sorry about that. And so, uh, consequently, yeah, it's a bit of a dilemma. I think damage can be done by uh, by proceeding as if we had settled, for example, the question of Hume's dictum, or we had settled the question of like how best to understand metaphysical dependence and so on. So I think we, you just always have to have some little voice in your ear saying, okay, go for it, but just keep in mind <laughs> that there are these other approaches. They're, they haven't been ruled out. Properly testing your own hypothesis requires properly engaging with, you know, your best viable con contenders and so on and so forth. So I think there might be, in a way, there, there's, there's no question that there's some tension there and we just have to live with that at present, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely agree with that. That's 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 uh, makes sense to me. <laughs> um, yeah, I think well, that's a good place to wrap it up. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to to take my questions and provide your detailed and, and thoughtful responses. It's been it's been excellent. Thank you, Troy. Those were really fantastic questions, and I uh, really enjoyed our conversation.